at titled Lateral Assessment, Rehabilitation, and Results. My name is Ted Deboda, and I'm Executive Director of NASCO, and I'll be the moderator for this webcast. Before we start, I want to thank the sponsors of this webcast, ProPipe and BLD Services. These companies have both been very involved in NASCO's lateral committee, and they actually represent the current leadership of the committee. I want to take a few minutes right now to introduce NASCO and the lateral committee. NASCO's mission for almost 40 years has been to set industry standards for the assessment and rehabilitation of underground infrastructure and to assure the continued acceptance and growth of transit technologies. Now, the Lateral Committee is one of NASCO's most active committees. In 2014, they wrote six articles for Trensys Technology Magazine, including Grout Sealing, Lateral Connections, an Innovative Approach to Private I&I, &I, and Lateral Rehab Cincinnati Style, among others. The Lateral Committee also wrote a white paper titled Overview of Lateral and Main Lateral Connection Lining and Sealing Technologies. This free reference provide the detailed description of the seven primary rehabilitation technologies used in laterals today. Now they include sectional pipelining or lining a portion of the pipe, lateral pipelining or lining the entire pipe, uh, entire lateral pipe, main lateral connection lining, lining the connection between the lateral and the main line, lateral and main lateral connection lining, which involves lining a portion of the lateral and lining that lateral main connection main lateral connection sealing using resin injection, lateral and main connection grouting using chemical grout injection, and finally lateral pipe bursting in replacing all or part of the lateral by pipe bursting. Uh, this webinar will focus on some of these technologies, but for more information about all of these technologies, please feel free to download the free white paper, which you can find in the NASCO.org website under Publications and Specifications. I'd also suggest downloading what our many specification guidelines in that same location on the website to help writing specifications for this, these technologies. Now, we want this to be interactive. So during the presentation, you will have the ability to send questions to the presenters using the questions pane. You should see this panel on the right-hand side of your screen labeled questions. Just type in your question and click send. I'll be monitoring your questions. And we'll have time between presentations and at the end to, pre to present some of them to the panel. Now, this webcast focuses on lateral assessment, rehabilitation, and results. Some of the key points of this webcast include WSSC's approach to inspecting and rehabilitating laterals and le their lessons learned, analysis of various lateral rehabilitations and factors to consider during design, and lateral rehabilitation and implementation from a utility perspective. Now we have an excellent group of speakers today, including Sean Peters from the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, WSSC, Jonathan Cune from CDM Smith, and Jason Waterbury from the Metropolitan District Commission in Hartford, Connecticut. Now at this time, we'd like to take a quick poll to find out how many participants we have. So if you would please, please uh, fill this out. We'll give you about uh, 15 or 20 seconds. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, our first presenter is Sean Peters, who currently manages the Lateral and Mainline Inspection Contracts Program for the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, WSSC. His career in the industry started in 2005 with URS Corporation as a field inspector working on SSES contracts in Maryland. In 2007, he was hired with WSSC as a construction inspector for water and sewer rehabilitation. In 2012, he was promoted to his current position managing CCTV operations. Sean? Thanks, Ted. For a little background information, WSC was established in 1918, and at that time we housed approximately 60 miles of sanitary sewer. Today we're the eighth largest water and wastewater utility in the nation, and we serve a 1,000 square mile area in Montgomery and Prince George's counties, and that's the Maryland metropolitan area that surrounds Washington, D.C. 
Our system now contains approximately 5,500 miles of sewer mains, with the majority of that construction taking place in the 40s and 50s. We serve a population of 1.8 million people through approximately 460,000 customer accounts, which is also a rough estimate of the sewer levels that we have in our system. And as I explain all of our processes, you'll see how our size makes it difficult and crucial to get a handle on the problems that we find in the system. WC has historically maintained sewer laterals from the main line to the property line, with our only exception being that easement connections typically terminate at the right-of-way line. Property owners are responsible for maintaining the lateral portion from the building out to the property line. WCC entered into a consent decree on December 7, 2005. The SR3 program, which is abbreviated for Sewer Repair, Replacement, and Rehabilitation, was developed as a multi-year effort to improve the condition of our collection system assets in conjunction with the consent decree. This allowed for a database system to organize and track improvements in order to meet our goals. So today I'll talk briefly about why WSC considered tackling laterals, the lateral defects that we typically encounter, lateral inspection and construction contract development, the lateral inspection process and design aspects, lessons we've learned along the way, the pre-construction review process, typical rehab methods that we use, the construction inspection process, and issues that we've encountered in the field. Why did WSSE consider performing lateral work? Our consent order intends to minimize I&I, &I, basement backups, and SSOs, which means we need to tackle all areas in a proactive manner. Lateral connections with a high priority at the main line were identified in our SR3 plan, but that was only based on what could be seen from the main. The observations usually noted some type of infiltration, defect, or root growth at the connection or within the lateral as far as the camera could zoom. Those laterals were assigned a priority level in our master database. In the beginning, we were essentially trying to keep up with problems in our system by placing a single lateral on a contract here and there, but we really needed a better way to improve the system as a whole. So if you take a look at the CCTV pictures shown here, you can see how a lot of assumptions could be made for the remaining condition of the lateral. On the left, you can see roots at the first joint in the lateral, and on the right, you can see a similar situation from the main line. Here are a couple more examples of how you could speculate the condition of the entire lateral. You can see grease at the main line connection and a typical view of deposits attached, but once again, you really can't tell what's going on just out of sight. We try to assemble candidates for lateral contracts based on clustered rehab work. The idea here was to take action where our rehab efforts were already taking effect. The ultimate goal would be to rehabilitate one area at a time in order to limit disturbance from construction. We've seen instances where a single house connection has been excavated and only completed once the rehab contract came through later on a following year. In these cases, the residents are dealing with our teams working on their street for more than a year at times, depending on the type of work that takes place. In other instances, the county's just paved the roadway and placed a moratorium on excavation. With the amount of rehab taking place, a larger picture was taken into account and we developed an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts in order to keep work flowing. And that's basically a main master contract that has task orders generated within. So a little bit about the inspection and design process. We first identify sewer asset candidates and retrieve the customer data for each lateral tied to a component. We research work order history for each asset and customer in order to avoid reinspecting laterals that have been rehabbed recently. WSC has a project management team of consultants that manage the overall lateral construction program and they're responsible for reviewing inspection data, making rehab recommendations, and assembling construction task orders that are issued to a WSOC contractor. In addition to that consultant team, we have inter internal staff that are continuing the long-term program. The chart diagram that I've pictured here is a typical layout of all laterals that should be found on a particular main. You can see comments to the right that state an ID change took place, which is a sort of an example of how record keeping and documentation isn't always perfect. This was an instance where records showed that the customer tied to a main line, but the lateral was later found to enter a manhole. So getting into the inspection process, 
Contractors are given a release of main lines in need of lateral TV, along with the header information that was shown on the previous screen. And here you can see a typical GIS map of our line that needs inspection in green. Early on, we realized that we needed to do more than simply inspect the internal portion of the lateral pipe. So our consultants developed an above-ground database with a form interface that would allow the contractor to enter above-ground features in conjunction with the internal pipe inspection that may affect an excavation. Here you can see the interface that is shown in the field for observation input. Here's a small sample of what is seen during the above-grade survey. Along with the data entry, the contractors also provide a sketch of the inspected area. Here you can see the above grade features being entered into the database and below is a generic sketch that shows you how this information appears in plan view. Here's an actual sketch that you can compare with the photograph of the same lateral inspection. The distance of the trees noted as well as other features. In this picture you can see paint cans sitting on top of the clean out cover. This helps us save time by avoiding field visits to see if our rehab method matches the landscape. The viewer can take all the information provided and make the best recommendation based on the site as a whole. There are instances when TV is not always possible, but we can still obtain valuable data. Some connections in our system enter at a 12 o'clock position in the main. On the left, you can see a standard construction detail from 1960, which shows a typical setup. The taps are typically a break-in and they bend at a Y to run horizontally toward the property. In the top photograph, you can see how this appears on the main line. And below, you can see how it appears once you pull up and pan into the lateral. This creates a situation where, in most cases, the lateral camera cannot push its way into the horizontal portion of the lateral. Without a clean out the TV from, we're forced to perform partial inspections, which include anything found above grade. In most of these cases, our intention was to excavate and replace with a new version of our drop house connection when it enters at a 45 degree angle and involves a point repair at the connection to properly abandon the old main connection. Once the field work's complete, our teams review the data and make recommendations based on pipe and above ground conditions combined. Our goal is to use trenchless technologies such as lining and grouting wherever possible in order to limit disturbance. Lateral pipe bursting was used in areas where excavation was not preferred. Above ground features are a big factor when deciding to use excavation methods. In some instances, we install cleanouts on laterals where a clear picture is not possible in order to clean and re-televise in most cases. This cleanout can be used during the rehab process, which is part of our decision on cost effectiveness. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty over the slides advancing. Um, you can just prompt me and I'll go ahead and advance them for you. Okay, where are you? We're on review process slide. Yeah, I'm just trying to find you, Vicki, where to throw the slide at you to give you control. Sorry, okay. everyone. Okay. You got it? <laughs> All right, next slide. There you go. Okay, there we are. We have a few typical scenarios in lateral rehab methods. I came up with a quick guide to help our inspectors get a handle on payment methods. The standard construction detail shown here gives you a clear picture of all the major components used in our typical rehab scenarios. The first picture on the left shows a vacuum excavated cleanout as an additional option to limit disturbance. This option allowed us to do work in close proximity to trees and other above ground structures, but tree roots can still pose difficulties at times. The second picture to the right shows an open cut excavated cleanout where the main problem was caused by the joining of different pipe materials at the property connection in our system. We have some laterals that were stubbed out with six inch concrete during main line construction and later connected with four inch cast iron, which typically ends up with a void area around the two different pipe materials which are simply pushed together. 
In this diagram to the right, you can see where the excavated cleanout is used in conjunction with lining. Here's a view of what I touched on in the previous slide when talking about excavated cleanouts. You can see the four inch cast iron pushed into the six inch concrete pipe as seen from a lateral launch camera looking toward the property. We discussed the possibility of using a transitional liner to contour to the size change, but with cost and risk involved, this made a much better case for simply excavating and attaching to the four inch with a Fernco style coupling. Open cut replacement for the entire laterals employed when trenchless techniques are not preferred. Some of those scenarios could be offset joints, heavy roots throughout, or slope issues. We typically use chemical resin or grout mainline connection seals as well as short liners with full sewer main wrap when joined to a lined main. This diagram to the right shows the optional sealing methods at the main in conjunction with payment. The photo on the left shows a site with temporary restoration after a complete excavation of the laterals taken place. At a later date, we return with a paving and landscape crew for permanent restoration. Here's a view from within the main showing our most common lateral interface seals. On the left, you can see a chemical grout seal, and on the right, you can see a full wrap lateral liner that was installed after the main had been lined. Ideally, we would want to rehabilitate the laterals along the main when rehab the main and finally come back for lateral seals, but with such a large system with many contracts running, timing it perfectly can be difficult. Construction inspection is another big part of our rehab efforts. We have a large staff of full-time employees as well as consultant inspectors that cover multiple contracts and sites each day in their role is not only important to enforcing rehab methods, but also proper documentation and accurate record keeping of as-builts. Once rehab is complete, post-TV is performed for final approval. Here you can see a typical example of a WSSC plumbing card that is sketched for record and then later filed. We encounter a whole host of problems along the way, and WSSC has taken large efforts in maintaining customer satisfaction. Before and after photographs are very useful for restoration purposes. Here you can see a photo of the same property. On the left, you see a before picture with a tree present, and on the right, you'll notice the tree has been removed as well as the clear trench path from the excavation that took place. There are times where we need to access the areas located behind private property, and in those instances, we provide a right of entry form for documentation purposes. Homeowners are notified before inspection and construction work take place. We've also created a customer advocate position, which allows for direct contact that residents can reach out to. The advocates and contract managers often attend community meetings to address the concerns of an entire community. We have four advocates that have a designated region where they essentially serve as representatives for our customers. The majority of the advocates' responsibilities involves listening to neighborhood complaints, explaining why WSSC's processes are necessary, and follow up with customers to ensure contractors have performed satisfactory restoration work. Permitting is still required in some instances. In this region, we have multiple roadway governing bodies, whether it be federal, state, or local. We also have parkland and environmentally sensitive areas with multiple authorities. Tree removal is taken very seriously and also requires permitting depending on the location. The process of obtaining permits complicates the assembly of a contract package, so there are times when multiple task orders are on hold until all documentation is received. So overall, laterals play an important role in solving our system's I&I issues, as well as preventing basement backups and SSOs. Rehab of active laterals and proper abandon of laterals that are no longer in service will ultimately help us achieve this goal. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand it back to Ted. Thank you, Sean. Um, we have some time. Let's, let's take a few questions. Uh, we've been getting your questions. And, and by the way, I appreciate you guys uh, asking the questions. Um, First question, uh, Sean, how did you prioritize the lateral? Did you prioritize based on condition, or were there other factors that you looked at um, in the lateral? Typically, uh, Ted, we were prioritizing based on what the mainline rehabilitation was calling for at first. Um, the recent 
little run that we did was based on the, the mains needing rehab for lining, essentially. Um, we do have a decent amount here and there where there's, you know, issues with the laterals, and you can check the history on those houses. So, you know, we did try to jump on to the laterals that had the most problems or ones that have potential problems based on mainline history. Um, but once again, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, so on, what kind of materials did you run into in your laterals, uh, like PVC or clay? What, what was the predominant materials you ran into? Most of the time when we're doing excavation, um, obviously you can see it before you line. Um, but mainly we're pulling out vitrified clay, uh, concrete pipe, um, and the other main material would be the 4-inch cast iron. Um, a lot of break-in taps, well, you know, a lot of them are not factory. Uh, so we also have problems at the main line as well as the property line. Okay. And uh, someone was pretty observant noticed that the construction card that you showed on one of the slides indicated the uh, downspouts were connected. Um, obviously, being involved in I and I, were they removed? Yeah. Anytime we find uh, connections like that, we do we we do away with those. Um, be it that we surround DC, which you know essentially is a combined system. We have some of that stuff left over that you find occasionally and in other times where it's been illegally connected. But yeah, anywhere that we find any other form of above ground water coming in, we'll definitely take care of those while we while we see them. But that's not every lateral, you know, that's just a random basis again. Yeah, and I guess kind of a follow up to that was what what information did you have on I and I related to the segment or or maybe the laterals themselves? A lot of the things that we had tackled early on were based on our uh, SSES programs that were going on where we had the, the overall basin looked at and, and did an evaluation survey. Um, so essentially, you know, the, those would be the basins that we tackle first. Um, and we had flow data, uh, I and I, where we did, you know, night flow uh, at, at low use times, um, previous TV. Uh, we do trunk walk, you know, occasionally have a right-of-way entry lateral. Um, so a lot of, all of those factors kind of jump in and, and help us figure it out. But flow monitoring is definitely another big big part of it. Okay. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, can you explain again uh, the full wrapped profile liner? Sure, and uh, we'll, we'll touch on that later, obviously. But, um, but essentially, uh, those liners are inserted from the main um, and you know, they probably cover the first, I don't know, maybe three to four feet. It kind of depends on the liner, but they'll, they'll, they'll wrap the full, you know, the entire circumference of the main. Um, so you're essentially sealing out that entire rotation where the lateral meets the main. And then they'll shoot up the liner, you know, like I say, three to four feet. Um, and that, that, that makes a nice seal right at the, at the main line connection. Okay. Yeah, we have we have a few more questions. If that's that's okay. Sure. Um, you only uh, do lateral rehabilitation after mainline connection, or do you do some prior to mainline connection? And are there any considerations for th that you used for that? Well, we do both essentially. Um, I said early on that you know it would be optimal to be able to to come through and hit all the laterals in one stretch and come back and do the mains and do the ceiling. Um, but the system's so huge and there's so many contracts running that we really can't time everything to hit the laterals first, do the main line second. Um, so it's kind of, it, you know, it, it kind of just depends on how the contracts are running. Um, we used to have contracts where we do mains and laterals in the same contract. Um, and that, that happens occasionally, but, um, you know, with the amount of work taking place, uh, they started doing just lateral contracts and just mainline contracts so that they would kind of follow one another. And I'm sorry if I missed the second part of that question, Ted. Well, no, I think you hit it, it's whether, whether you do it before or after. And I think that you're right, there's a lot of considerations in trying to coordinate, you know, the projects that way. Yeah, I th um, think on a small, sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think, you know, uh, on a system that was smaller, um, you know, you, you, like a township or something like that, you, you might be able to play with the timing a little better. But, you know, with our basin being so huge, it's, it's, it's really tough for us to kind of do it in the perfect order. Right, right. What was the average uh, depth of the laterals, and did you run into groundwater issues? 
Uh, we do occasionally have uh, depth issues, I mean groundwater issues. Uh, the depth typically ends up being anywhere from five to nine feet or so. Um, we did start finding some pretty deep connections where we had to, you know, do a change order and add some, some depth uh, notes on the pay items, essentially, where, you know, you start seeing 12 to 13 foot deep laterals, and uh, especially at the main line with those drop connections that you saw pictured earlier, uh, where it dumps in at 12 o'clock, um, you definitely find those to be on a lot of the deeper mains. Um, and it's a pretty hilly region, if I can use that term. You know, the, the top topography is, is pretty, you know, it, it fluctuates a lot. So um, that's one thing that, that, that plays a big role in it. Um, and groundwater, we did have, you know, we do have issues. A lot of clay in the area, um, so it's not, it's not crazy. But we do get into areas where it's kind of swampy and, you know, you're, you're worried about pumping and, um, you know, the, the environmental aspect, we have our own environmental department, too, which kind of represents the state of Maryland. So, um, you know, we, we kind of try to stay safe on all ends of it and take care of it while we're there. Right. Had, had you done any analysis related to where, when, and, and life expectancy issues com uh, of uh, the rehabilitation compared to util utilizing chemical grouting? I mean, me personally, I haven't had experience with that. I don't know if anyone's done life expectancy studies with grout itself in our system. Um, I personally haven't really seen it failing, and uh, we are still using it. So, uh, you know, I would say based on that that it's that we haven't seen a high fail result. Um, and uh, but you know, like I say, it's still being used here and there. Um, we see a lot of the the full wrap liners being used. Um, and, and hard resin seals uh, as well, where they grind out the connection. Um, and so that, that's another, another thing that we use. OK, let me, let me uh, give you one more question. Sure. What was the extent of the lateral replacement? Did you go all the way to the property line, all the way to the house? Um, uh, how was it determined? Yeah, we, well, actually, um, Early on, you'll, you'll, if you'll note, uh, WC only handles the, you know, we, we take care of the laterals from the main line to the property lines. Um, and we, we don't tackle anything from the property line in toward the property, you know, the, the home itself, if it, if it is a residence. Um, if, there's a prop, if there's a problem between the house and the property line, that typically falls on the, on the homeowner. Right, and I know that's, uh, I mean, with all the people listening, I know that's different in a lot of different situations. Um, sure. We are going to hear from a few more. So thank you, Sean. I appreciate you. Sure. Your, uh, time on thank this. you, Ted. Appreciate it. Our next presenter is Jonathan Cunet. Jonathan has worked in the civil environmental uh, consulting industry for 12 years on a variety of trenchless projects, including cured in place pipelining, manhole rehabilitation, service lateral lining, and facilities planning including infrastructure rehabilitation and asset management. Mr. Kune has a bachelor's of civil engineering and a minor in environmental engineering from the University of Cincinnati. He has his professional engineering license in Massachusetts, is LEED AP certified, and is certified in NASCO's Pipeline Assessment Certification Program, uh, and as well as MACP for manholes and LACP for laterals. Jonathan currently works for CDM Smith in Boston, Massachusetts. John, Jonathan? Thank you, Ted. Um, today I'm going to talk about how to navigate the service lateral connection line of market. Um, again, trying to go through these slides here. Here we go. So service lateral connections are uh, liners are trenchless rehabilitation products that seal the annular space that exists between a service lateral and its connection to a previously CIPP line, mainline pipe. These products can also extend up into a service lateral uh, that seals out infiltration and provides a structural solution. But this particular presentation is not really about what service lateral connections are or, or how they work, but, but rather instead today we're, we'll discuss a roadmap that can be used during the design process and, and factors that you should consider when planning rehabilitation recommendations, including different styles or of connections and uh, like shown here we show a full wrap uh, on the left and a, a brim style uh, liner on the right. 
We'll also discuss uh, different resin types and different materials and installation methods, and the lengths up into the lateral that can be sealed as, as other factors that should be considered. And then hopefully at the end, uh, those of you who are listening uh, can hopefully you know, get some sort of valuable knowledge uh, on how to design appropriate solutions and know what important questions to ask to ensure that you recommend the most cost-effective plan and, the, and the, you know, the most technologically appropriate solution. Now, service laterals can, and their connections to the main can contribute 50 percent and sometimes more of the, infl of the inf infiltration that you see in a collection system. Uh, but with the advent of of new technology and methods of installation as, as well as documented successes of these products in removing infiltration, service lateral connection lines have become a commonplace solution in rehabilitation programs and a, a critical component for comprehensive rehabilitation programs. As I mentioned before, service lateral connection liners, uh, their purpose is that to seal that annular space between the service lateral and, the, and a CIPP lined mainline sewer. In addition, these liners can extend up into the service laterals at various lengths and increase the life expectancy of a critical component of the collection system, which until recently has been neglected. Uh, before service lateral connection liners were available, the, the connections uh, were grouted following the reinstatement of services after CIPP lining. Um, chemical grout is not a structural uh, process, but, but uh, it, it does, it does do the job in sealing that annular space, and, um, and like I said, it was the, initially the only thing available before service lateral connection liners were on the market. Uh, this chemical grout can be acrylamide or urethane, and when it hardens, it becomes a hardened gel or resin that seals that annular space. And chemical grout has a life expectancy of somewhere between 5 and 20 years, and this, this time varies based on a variety of different factors, which I'll discuss a little bit later. So, no matter what, though, what is ultimately recommended for your particular program, chemical grout will be used in some fashion on every project. And, and that's just simply because not every single lateral can be lined with a service lateral liner. And there's a lot of reasons for that as well, and that's uh, what we'll discuss here in the future. And the, the, first, the first service uh, lateral connection liner that was available in the marketplace was a brim seal or a top hat. This, is, uh, this utilizes a circular brim that extends three inches around the service lateral, has a design life similar to that of a CIPP uh, or a cured in place uh, mainline liner, which is 50 or, or more years. The connection in the main, as I said, was a, was a brim style, but the way it was um, uh, inserted up into the main line, up into the service lateral itself was two different methods. There was a, a one part or a two part system. The, the one-part system shown on the left uh, that was installed first and then uh, goes up to, uh, to the first joint about six inches up into the lateral. And then on the right you see a two-part system in which part one is inserted first and installed and then part two overlaps that first part and extends up further into the lateral at varying distances. The, uh, the, second, the second type of service lateral liner or connection liner that was that was invented, the sort of the second iteration was a full wrap service service connection liner. Uh, also a CIPP method, it goes around the full circumference of the mainline pipe extending four to six inches on either side of the service lateral connection to the main and it, uh, it also had a service life similar to the CIPP lining of 50 plus years. Again, one part or two part system was available for this type of technology. This table shows the different types of service lateral connection sealing that are available, uh, how far up into the lateral the type of technology can seal, the design life of the particular product, and then a range of installed costs. Uh, you can see here that that service lateral connection liners can extend up 50 feet to, or even further up to a house, to the property line, to the clean out, depending on how much the municipality owns is how far you may want to go. Uh, we'll talk about distances up into the lateral in a little bit. But you can see here that at the further up you go, the more expensive, obviously, the, the liner becomes. But it's not a linear, linear relationship. And the reason for that uh, is, is because of uh, well, installation methods and, and cost of material and so on and so forth. Again, I'll get into that stuff later, but uh, 
these are uh, the different types of ways you could seal. And the next thing is once you've decided how you want to uh, or how you want to seal, the, the next thing is to, to think about all the different factors to consider during your design. So some of the factors to consider uh, include the design life or the service life of the product, the, the goals of the rehabilitation program, meaning are you, are you under a consent order and you need to remove very large percentages of infiltration by volume or are you just simply trying to shore up your system uh, and just do preventative maintenance? Uh, the liner type or the style of liner, meaning how the liner is installed uh, and production rates that you hope to achieve. The distance up into the lateral required for rehabilitation, something that should be considered. Again, this ties back into the goals of the rehabilitation program. And last but certainly not least, the, the mainline pipe size and shape of the mainline. Um, generally, we don't see very large transmission lines that, uh, or, or, or you know, interceptor lines that have service laterals, but in some cases you do, and uh, generally service lateral connection liners uh, are not appropriate and can, can't be installed in very large diameter sewers. So the, the first thing that I mentioned was design life or service life. The design life of a product is is an estimate of that product's longevity based on calculations related to its, its design, whereas the service life is the actual amount of time that elapses before a particular component of a product fails. So, for example, chemical grout has a design life of as high as 20 years, but the actual service life of the product varies to, depending on environmental factors such as the groundwater table. So, to expand on this further, chemical grout expands when it gets wet and then it contracts when it dries out and this back and forth expansion and contraction can limit the actual service life of the grout. Sorry, I'm all trying to advance forward here. There we go. That in some situations though, it, it may be advantageous and, and appropriate to recommend chemical grout only. Uh, for example, if the groundwater table is, is very high and your service connections are constantly submerged in this high groundwater table, you can be ensured that the longevity of the grout uh, will, will likely perform up to that 20-year design life. However, or in, in, in other situations where your goals maybe aren't so robust that you don't need to have such a, an aggressive infiltration removal program, uh, it's possible that in these situations recommending chemical grout only is proper is a proper solution after you reinstate your, your lateral connections following CIPP lining of the main line. However, if the groundwater table varies uh, in your for, in your area, or if service laterals the actual condition of the service laterals is pr particularly bad, or if simply you have a long-term comprehensive rehabilitation program, maybe that's consent order driven, which requires the removal of high percentages of infiltration by volume then recommending service lateral connection liners would be preferred. Now, once you've decided to recommend service lateral liners for your particular project, the first step would be to determine which type of connection in the main you'd like to use. We've described already there were two types, the brim style uh, and full wrap uh, type. And in cases where you might like to recommend uh, a full wrap service lateral connection liner, in instances where the mainline pipe has not been already lined with, with a CIPP in the main line. Uh, another situation is um, when service lateral connections have, um, have been overcut or have shifted during the curing process. The, this picture shows here uh, um, the, the clean looking cut circle on the bottom of the picture is, was the initial cut of the service lateral connection when it was reinstated. Uh, the lateral, the um, I'm sorry, the mainline liner shrunk further, and uh, and you can see it shifted, and had we had to actually reinstate the lateral a second time. So recommending a full wrap in this situation would line over both of those defects and seal the lateral connection as well. Um, in instances where you uh, have already lined the mainline pipe and you don't want to uh, further reduce the carrying capacity of the mainline then it would maybe be advantageous to recommend a, a top hat or a brim style service lateral liner. Once you've decided how that connection in the main is, is going to look like and what type, what type it will be, the, the next step is to determine how far up uh, the lateral to, to recommend uh, for lining. Uh, this decision you know, is based on the condition of the lateral as I mentioned earlier and, 
and also the removal goals of the project. The liners can extend from six inches, typically reaching that first joint, or all the way up to the property line or even into the house. Um, one of the factors that, that uh, dictates how far up you should recommend is the groundwater table. Uh, in many parts of the country, lining 15 feet up away from the main will get you out of the groundwater table. But we all know it's usually the case uh, working with municipalities and cities and towns, the, the available funding is what really drives the design. Uh, at some point, you may start to see diminishing returns with the further you extend up a lateral. So, the, you know, the, the actual material costs aren't what drives this. Uh, the, the actual material costs are, are pretty low in comparison to the labor involved, the actual the, the amount of time it takes to install the liner and the curing, uh, the amount of time it takes to cure it actually add to that cost. And, and this is how the funding sort of comes into play when you're, um, when you're going through this decision process. Another thing to consider is the installation method. Uh, not all service lateral connection liners can be installed unless they have a, unless they have a clean out. Uh, where, where I am here in, in New England, uh, we typically don't have clean outs. Um, in other parts of the country, uh, where I went to college uh, in Cincinnati, there are clean outs. So in any case, private property becomes an issue, whether you're accessing a clean out outside the house or whether you have to install a new clean out, private property is an issue. Uh, and uh, in some cases where you don't already have a clean out, the, the cost to install a new clean out needs to also be factored in. That's an additional cost. It needs to be factored in to the, the overall cost of installing a service lateral connection line. Uh, additional factors to consider during the design process, um, you know, the, the TVing, the extents of which you hope to line, um, whether there are bends, the orientation of the lateral at the main, pipe size changes within the service lateral, and then, of course, the design and, and the installation methods used for each type of product. Now, that, that first thing, prior to design, and installation, you know, all services must be televised in some fashion um, to so that you can see what what it is you're going to uh, to line into, and whether or not you can actually line. So, for example, if if you've recommended a, a service lateral liner that extends just a, a foot or two up into the lateral, you could get away with using a simple pan and tilt camera, which would be able to see those extents. But if you decided to recommend a, a service lateral liner that extends up up further, say 10 feet or up to the property line or even to the house, uh, you would need to utilize a lateral launching camera. And there are specialty contractors to do this. Uh, there are additional costs involved. And these are some things that need to be considered. The, the bends that exist uh, within the actual lateral itself must also be investigated and understood. Um, not all service lateral liners can navigate bends. Um, some some companies claim that they can, and when they when they do the installation, you, you get wrinkles or you get uh, a blockage of some sort, which obviously you, you want to try to avoid. So understanding all of uh, what you know geometry of your system is an important important thing to note. Uh, in some cases, you may recommend a service lateral liner that extends up six feet, but uh, when you get out there in reality and you televise it, you you find that there's a bend that can't be navigated and the liner must be cut short, maybe maybe cut short a few feet a few feet shorter than what you'd hope to accomplish and and then in this case you and, and your client are, are not able to to get the product that, that you hope to to get initially when it was put in out for bid. Um, the orientation of the service lateral liner to the main is also something that should be considered during design. Uh, this is sort of a unique situation but I've come across it over the years, and, and I thought it would be at least worth sharing. The picture you see on the left is from the, you're looking at down a mainline pipe, and you see a service lateral connection coming in at about 11 o'clock. Uh, however, in reality, the, the lateral itself is actually coming in perpendicular to the main line. So the picture on the right is, is what you see when you look up into that lateral. You just, you see a pipe wall. Uh, this is a situation where uh, a lateral liner obviously could not be installed here. In fact, chemical grout couldn't be used either because the packer just simply couldn't get in uh, to, um, to pump the grout into that annular space. So uh, understanding th these odd little orientations of, of laterals is something that 
that needs to be considered. Um, oftentimes, you know, to scare people, but oftentimes you, you just see a typical a T or Y connection that's factory made, and, and, and those are, are pretty straightforward, and lateral liners can go through or can be installed in them. But like I said, sometimes you see some odd things like this. And, uh, they need to be investigated. The, the pipe size change um, within, a, within a lateral needs to be understood, especially uh, if you're if you're recommending longer service lateral connection liners, um, standing uh, going up into the service pipe, you know it, it might start as a four or a, a five or a six inch at the main, but typically the cast iron that comes from the house is a four inch. Um, not all service lateral liners can navigate these pipe size changes. Um, some can, um, some some can. No matter what, some actually need to be manufactured ahead of time. In which case you would need to have an exact measurement of where that pipe size change occurs and it would need to be fabricated uh, in the factory before it was delivered to the site. If you don't do this and you haven't thought through, um, you might try to install a, a service lateral liner and you, you couldn't really tell that it went from a 5 to a 4 and the liner gets installed and causes a blockage or some wrinkles uh, and the, you know, the wrinkles eventually lead to a blockage and, and you get a backup and again, things you want to try to avoid. Uh, the last, the last factor to consider is um, is often a contentious issue, and op opinions vary widely. I'm I'm just going to state facts here, uh, but it's it's the way that the liners are installed, and then the way that the liners remain in place. So, one method is the inversion method, which is works the same way as installing a CIPP mainline liner, and this utilizes resin migration to remain in place. Uh, the other method is the inflation or the packer method. Um, works more where the where the uh, where a bladder sort of is inserted and the it, and is expanded out and and uh, the liner then cures uh, by being pressed against the pipe wall. This forms uh, what they call a mechanical bond. So in the case of resin migration, as the liner is and this picture is let's take a shift it a little bit. I apologize for that. So you can picture that liner is actually supposed to be right in the in the main line or in the uh, lateral pipe there, but the idea is that the the liner, when it is installed, the resin, excess resin, is impregnated in those layers of felt, and that resin sort of leaks out, seeps out, migrates out, if you will, into defects in the lateral and into uh, actually at the terminus of the the liner inside the lateral pipe. This this allows the the resin to to bind the liner to the to the pipe and keep it in place and keep out any infiltration. The other method is, uh, that's, this picture actually it still looks good, but it's a little off on the words there. I apologize for that. But uh, this uses uh, the hydrophilic seal. And the hydrophilic material increases in the presence of water, and that seals the annular space between the hose pipe and the liner in case of a bond failure. Uh, this is, this is uh, under the auspices of uh, the situation where uh, the liner doesn't actually bind to the mainline pipe, as in CIPP lining. There's actually this annular space, and instead, if water were to migrate between the host pipe and the new liner, uh, it runs into this this sort of dam, this block, uh, this blockage, which is that hydrophilic seal, and it keeps the, uh, the infiltration from entering back into the system. So, in conclusion. Rehabilitating only the mainline pipe addresses only a fraction of your infiltration in the system. If you're trying to remove very large portions of infiltration, then uh, you know attacking the other component, meaning service laterals, and giving it a service life similar to that of CIPP lining is an important thing to, to consider. Um, service lateral connection liners that have very many a lot of variables to consider when you're doing the design, and a detailed evaluation of a collection system is required in order to understand all these different variables and come up with a good solution to your problem. And uh, with that, I think we may have some time for some questions. Ted, if I would be happy to answer any if, if you have some. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We've been actually getting a lot of questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and go through uh, what I can in the time that we have. Uh, now, have you experienced a line, liner wrinkling problems with the full wrap product and if so, how do you how do you resolve them, and what kind of problems do they cause? Uh, full wrap liner wrinkles. Um, I, I, I've seen a little bit of wrinkling. I, I would say I've not seen any worse than 
than what I have for mainline pipelining. Um, there, there have been a few instances over the course of, I've, I've worked on some very large consent order driven projects and they've been you know, many years in the making, uh, year after year, lots of laterals and things like that. Um, and I have to say yes, every year there's at least a couple that have to be cut out. Uh, you go in and, and you literally have to cut it out um, with a robot and, uh, and, and reinstall it again. And, and also related to the full wrap uh, liners, um, how much do they shrink the, the idea of the main line with a gasketed versus non-gasketed uh, uh, versions or types? That's a good question. Um, well, the liners are actually pretty thin. I mean, they're, they're thinner than, and I don't want to, I don't want to quote an actual thickness of just and make something up all the top of my head, but, but I know that they're very thin. The, the, the amount that it gets reduced further, um, in, in my experience, is, is not enough to warrant not installing a full wrap. Um, the gasketed version, uh, basically, and, and I think what you mean by that is on either side of the, of the service where it connects to the main, um, there's a, a, a hydrophilic material that gets, that gets put on there. It, it causes a little bit of a bump, um, but, but it, it's, sort of, it's sort of designed to also have a taper, so it's, sort of, it's a pretty smooth transition, and a, a, it's certainly smooth enough such that you don't get uh, um, things solid um, getting caught on it or, or causing blockages, I can, I can at least say that. Right, right. And, and I'll tell you, in the shows, you can see a lot of the demos of these things, and maybe to say a quarter inch or something, but that may even be, uh, um, that, that's a total guesstimate, but you're right, it's designed to have such a smooth transition. It's kind of negligible, I think. Yeah, I um, mean, if, if we're going to throw around um, thicknesses, I mean, I would even say an eighth is probably, an eighth of an inch would probably be even Right. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I would not argue with that at all. Um, the other question is lateral connection liners are installed from the main. Why are cleanouts necessary? Uh, well, some products are just, that's the way they are installed. That was the, the way they were invented, and um, that's the way they, they are installed. I think I've, I've had conversations with people in the past um, who, who've used these or, or the people who actually designed them, and sometimes it's a matter of saying, well, you know, I, I just I don't feel comfortable doing it in the blind, meaning I want to have access to that upstream clean-out so that I can put in a camera and I can see things. As this as this line is being installed, there's there's a little bit of that. You know, it, it makes me a little scared to invert a liner here uh, and 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 hope that it's all going to open up and there's not going to be a slug of resin at the end. Um, and I and I think that's really uh, it's it's just a matter of comfort level and and some companies have it uh, that way and some have it a different way. But um, that's why there are lots of options out there is is to you know to give people choice. Okay. Let me ask. Uh, Give you one more question, and then we'll move on. But you demonstrated in the pictures that sealing the laterals caused the groundwater table to rise. Uh, and actually, we've we've done a lot of presentations on you know infiltration, the whole network of uh, of you know groundwater uh, avenues underground. Um, sealing la so did you consider construction of alternative drainage systems for the groundwater to avoid flooding or wetting a basement? That's uh that's an excellent one. That's we're just now coming into a situation in, in a city here in Massachusetts. Uh, they're under consent order, and we're we're helping them remove a considerable amount of infiltration from their system in the many millions of gallons from a, from even a one-year storm. Uh, we have a situation where uh, there was a, a low-lying uh, baseball diamond, and we lined a pipe that was essentially Swiss cheese. The, the laterals and were, were horrible, um, also just as bad as the main line. We lined everything, and now ducks swim on the baseball diamond, and, and people, the kids can't play. Um, uh, people are obviously upset. Residents are upset because, hey, you know, now, our, now our ball diamond's uh, you know, not usable, uh, and, and we're saying, hey, our first step was to come into compliance with a consent order, and we had to remove flow. Um, infiltration, I'm sorry, um, the, the next thing that happens now is we need to also upgrade your drainage because frankly they have inadequate drainage as well and I think a lot of times uh, municipal municipalities, cities and towns don't realize that they don't have adequate drainage because they have 
uh, porous sewer systems that are handling some of the drainage. So I think it's, it's really the next step, the next iteration that we're going to start seeing in this part of the industry is, is um, increases or, or design increases to drainage systems. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. That was, that was an excellent question, by the way. And yeah. let me just comment. We are getting a ton of questions, and it's great. I really appreciate everyone sending their questions in. We do have to move on. Uh, we will have some time uh, after our next presentation, our, our final presentation, uh, to answer some questions. Not surprisingly, a lot about having to do with doing work on private property. So, uh, mm -hmm. we're, But we need to move on. And our final presenter today is Jason Waterbury. And by the way, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Great presentation. Thank um, you, Ted. So Jason uh, Waterbury worked in the civil environmental industry for 14 years. He's been in the Metropolitan District Commission, MDC, in Hartford, Connecticut for seven years, primarily as a project manager on a variety of sanitary sewer planning, design, and construction projects. At MDC, he's also managing the MDC Sanitary Sewer Overflow Program which is being conducted in response to a 2006 EPA consent decree and overseeing the MDC's CMOM program. Jason has a Bachelor of Environmental Engineering from Wilkes University and a Master's of Environmental Engineering from the University of New Haven. Jason is a State of Connecticut Registered Professional Engineer and is also certified in NASCO's Pipeline Assessment Certification Program. Prior to working at MDC, Jason was at Malcolm Perney in Middletown, Connecticut for seven years. Jason? Thank you, Ted. Uh, a little technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. Um, some background about the MDC before I start. Uh, the MDC is a uh, municipal uh, organization in Connecticut, uh, chartered by the State of Connecticut General Assembly. Um, it serves uh, water and wastewater services to approximately 400,000 people in Hartford and uh, seven other surrounding towns. So we're essentially located in the northern central portion of Connecticut, for those of you who are familiar with the state. Uh, MDC sanitary sewer system. Uh, we own and maintain about 1,200 miles of sewers uh, throughout uh, the eight member towns with four, to, four water pollution control facilities uh, treating sewage collected from this uh, collection system. Um, the Hartford treatment plant, which is about 110 million gallons peak capacity, uh, takes flow from a combined system in Hartford, and then separate systems in Windsor and West Hartford and Newington. And then we have the three other treatment plants, which you see on the screen, uh, ranging in capacity of 5 to 12.5 MGD. And those are all separated systems. As Ted mentioned, uh, the district had been issued a consent order and consent decree uh, back in 2006. Um, the consent, de consent order itself uh, was targeted at reducing the amount of uh, com combined sewage overflows that were entering into the Connecticut River and also reducing the amount of nitrogen that was being released into the Connecticut River uh, via our Hartford Water Pollution Control Facility. The consent decree, which was issued by EPA, uh, specifically identified eight sanitary sewer overflows, uh, structural sanitary overflows, overflows that had to be closed in addition to um, other conditions of eliminating based on backups and system surcharges. And the Clean Water Project itself was targeted compliance with uh, all three of those items. Now, what is an SSO? Uh, some of you may know, some of you may not. So I just figured I'd put some pretty pictures on the screen. Um, the picture on the right is an outfall pipe from one of our eight sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, and the two pictures on the left represent uh, overflow coming out of manholes in the middle streets. Uh, typically, in our collection system, the peak time of year for that is the spring when groundwater is high and you have uh, rainfall events on top of snow melt. As I mentioned before, uh, the SSO program is uh, solely targeting uh, compliance with the consent decree from 2006. Um, that's the main objective. Uh, it has been the focus of my work over the last five years here within the district. Um, the, while the consent decree was issued in 2006, the uh, field work really started in 2005, but just in advance of the actual decree being signed. Um, and that was an SCS program uh, in which we uh, had an abundance of CCTV work, storm, um, smoke testing, and other uh, building inspections in certain areas. Um, we then used that information and uh, flow meters to build and calibrate a sewer model using the EPA SWIM model. 
Uh, the SWIM model that we built for the consent decree uh, compliance represented about 25 percent or 400 miles of our collection system. Uh, and that's all the areas upstream of those eight structural overflows. Um, the model was then used to evaluate various different improvements to our collection system uh, to comply with the consent decree. And those improvements were then uh, presented in, in three different uh, documents, which are uh, termed as the SSO elimination plan. Um, and those documents were provided to DEP and EPA for re review and approval back in 2010 and 2011. Um, concurrent to the development of those plans, uh, the district moved forward with what we targeted, the low, what we called the low-hanging fruit, uh, which is really lining um, the mainline sewers and manholes that were rated as uh, being in the worst areas for infiltration from our initial SSDS work. Uh, those contracts occurred in 2008 to 2011. Uh, they were two large mining contracts and manhole rehabilitation contracts. Uh, to put in perspective, uh, the two of them at the time totaled over 400,000 feet of mainline sewer that was lined, uh, which is a, a which is a large chunk of our sewer system. It's about 75 miles, uh, and again, this is only within the areas upstream of our eight SSOs. The SSO elimination plans that were developed in 2010-2011 uh, used an estimated of removal amount of 10 percent from this initial work and some other initial work that we had yet to be completed. Um, in developing the SSO elimination plans, we were trying to balance out removal from, uh, via uh, rehabilitation work versus increased capacity via uh, system improvements. And um, in addition, we needed to validate the 10% estimate as it had a large impact on our program moving forward. So because of this, we then moved into a, a pilot program uh, beginning in 2011 and concluding in 2014. Uh, this is just a picture of the SWIM model. Um, just to put in perspective again, this was done for 25% uh, of our collection system. Uh, roughly 400 miles was modeled. It was all pipes that were 12 inch and larger in our separated system. A uh, parallel model was uh, also uh, constructed for our combined sewer system as part of the consent order, and that was for pipes that were 18 inch and larger and also some storm drainage pipes too. Um, I always find this slide fascinating when I give engineering present presentations at like, high schools and whatnot is you can point out to the kids on the screen uh, the where on here it shows that the uh, water was going to be coming out of the, the manhole, such as one of the first pictures. So I figured I'd break up the presentation there. Uh, intent of lateral rehab. The Our historical approach at the district was uh, mainline lining, uh, cured in place pipe using water or steam cure, um, and grout sealing of laterals. And uh, while we had done the 400,000 feet of pipe in those two large contracts in 08, 2011. Uh, there were some smaller contracts that were done in advance of that. So a, a decent portion of the district's collection system had been rehabilitated using this method. Um, we, would we would also include point repairs uh, where needed, and, and that was only for lining purposes, and then lateral repairs only when structural needs or structural issues uh, arose. Keep a note on the screen that none of the lateral work or the repair work was being done for infiltration or, uh, or removal. And two pictures on the screen to show you uh, are the typical lateral, the typical mainline lining setup on the right, uh, and then the, the pre and post uh, with a clay tile sewer on the left. Um, the majority of the pipes that we lined as part of this program were uh, VC pipe, clay tile pipe. Um, some There was some RC pipe that we had also rehabilitated. So why was lateral lining considered? Um, well, while the mainline estimate was 10%, um, and it also included upgrades to the system, we want we knew that there may be more cost-effective means um, to reduce the number of of um, other improvements in the collection system. Um, sorry, someone interrupted my office there. The we, we then we looked at uh, lining to the property line and also lining to the ha uh, to the house connection. And then um, as part of the lateral lining program, we looked at ambient cure, uh, steam cure, and then from the main line and also from the house. Um, right away, uh, after talking to multiple contractors, um, which I'll, I'll discuss in a second, the house connection, um, lining from the house itself, 
was eliminated. It wasn't not it was not something that we wanted to embark on, trying to coordinate with um, multiple residents. Um, as you'll see later on, the, the counts of properties that are involved in this are very large. Uh, we wanted to minimize the public disturbance, minimize the public impact. Um, some background information on the pilot program. Um, the reason we were moving forward, as I said, was we wanted to know what infiltration and inflow was removed, at what cost, what was effective and what wasn't, and what was worth incorporating into future projects. As you can see on the screen, it wasn't just lateral lining. Uh, we also included open cut lateral replacement. Um, it was a comparison of, as a comparison for effectiveness and cost to lateral lining, um, and also just for lessons learned. Uh, we also included private property inflow removal, which in our case um, was mostly foundation drain disconnection. And then we also included uh, uh, the initial SCS recommendations and lateral connection seals on top of that. Now, for comparison purposes, each of these was done in multiple contracts so that we didn't have just one location we were looking at. Um, and we didn't have, we had multiple areas to compare to. Uh, so we had a proper uh, information moving forward in proper estimate. The designer for this project was CDM Smith. Um, the first decision we had to make was where do we want to do this work? What areas do we want to target for the pilot program? Um, certain areas, while they may have been labeled as uh, high, area, high areas for infiltration or inflow initially during the SCS investigation, had also been targeted for those initial lining contracts. So without um, a, a true baseline, it wasn't uh, an ideal situation to move forward with part of the pilot. So we targeted areas that had high I and I, but also had a minimal amount of work completed. Um, there was also some cost considerations. Uh, for example, one of the areas targeted for high inflow, uh, what, after doing the building inspections and preliminary design, the, the number of properties that were actually connected were in excess of 80% of the homes had foundation drains connected to our sewer system and the separation work would have cost $20 million. Now keep in mind I'm using the term separation. It is a separated system, but acting like combined in some cases. Uh, early on in the design phase also, we did install meters in each of these areas once we targeted them. Uh, we metered for a minimum of a year in each area to get a true pre-construction period uh, estimate. Um, we then held workshops with, on the lateral lining side with multiple vendors to try to uh, learn from them as far as what worked for them, what did not work, what less, what uh, advice they had uh, to try to guide us through the design phase and into uh, pre preparation of bid documents. Uh, one of the things that did come out of these workshops was the need for TV inspection for the lateral. So um, the two lateral lining contracts, which each included approximately 200 to 250 laterals, uh, all, had, all had their laterals TV inspected in addition to some other laterals that were eventually removed in uh, um, noted for uh, dig replacement instead. A little delay here on the screen. Um, my, there we go. Um, moving forward, the specifications bid documents, uh, we included a, uh, obviously on each, on the contract drawings we showed uh, what, what properties were getting aligned and what were not getting aligned uh, for the lateral. But in the specifications, we also included a tabular list of the properties to be aligned and the CCTV reports of all the laterals uh, that were to be aligned. On the plans, we showed cleanouts where cleanouts were identified as being needed. Um, one of the key items uh, in talking to contractors uh, and vendors during the design phase was to break up the lining into two bid items, uh, zero to five feet, which was treated as a lump sum, and then from five feet to the end of the lateral lining was a per foot cost. And you'll see later on that the length of the lateral did not impact the cost significantly. Um, impact on the residents during design, we did, you know, obviously the cleanouts are going to be um, determined on you know, where the existing lateral is, but we tried to avoid, uh, we tried to avoid heavily landscaped areas, we try to remove, avoid uh, tree removal or um, retaining walls and, and items like that, um, and also conflicts with other services such as gas and water. Um, and then failures, um, that was along the lines of from the TV inspection reports, if it looked questionable to be aligned, was it worth the risk or do we just want to dig and replace it instead? I skipped a slide.
slide somehow. Sorry about that. Um, anyways, uh, project implementation, which is a slide that's not on the screen right now. Um, the ownership of the laterals within the district is one other thing I'd like to mention and discuss. Um, our charter, uh, the MDC owns um, the mainline sewer, the property owners themselves own the laterals, and they own the lateral from the mainline line up to the house. However, we maintain the lateral from the mainline line up to the property line. Um, there were some unforeseen circumstances that came up during construction that I'd like, that I'd like to mention. Um, you know, there were some unlineable laterals despite the pre-TV. Uh, some of that is just by nature of the fact that the time frame from some laterals being TV inspected to actually being lined was in cases, in some cases, multiple years. So you had some that you know, did deteriorate farther than they had already been. Um, there was a couple cases of lateral lining failures where we had a, an emergency case bring a dig contractor in uh, to repair the failed liner. Um, they could not be cut out. Um, and then there was a bypass pumping lesson that we learned uh, that I feel is worthwhile mentioning. Um, when you're lining a lateral, in, in a lot of cases, you're, or even mainline lining, you're going to size your bypass system for the flow that you, that you feel is going to be coming through that sewer. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the residential areas that we're lining, they were um, they, minimal upstream areas were above them. You're talking one, two, maybe three pipe segments uh, upstream. Well, the bypass system in one case was sized uh, for the only uh, segment that was upstream of it. However, uh, there was also multiple other laterals being uh, cleaned and prepped in advance. Uh, of um, the rest of the day's work, and the bypass system was not sized to adequately handle the average daily flow plus the water generated from the two cleaning operations, and we did back up a house. So the lesson learned is to um, size your bypass pumping for the water that you're going to see in the pipe, not just the average daily flow. Um, one of the key things that I thought uh, really served us well uh, over the course of the construction projects was um, full-time inspection in resident engineering. We, um, we made sure from the very beginning um, that we had uh, adequate inspection staff on site 100% of the time and also a resident engineer for technical reasons on site all the times. Um, one of the key things with this was the public coordination. Uh, obviously, even on properties where you're not installing a clean out, you're going to impact the resident. Um, and you know, a well-informed public or well, you know, a public that feels that they have an avenue to ask questions is going to you know, generate less issues for you uh, moving forward than one that you, know, you just have the contractor out there without much oversight. Um, some lessons learned. No one-size-fits-all solution. Um, we, uh, we found that by doing multiple, pro well actually in doing multiple projects uh, we found that the there were some ranges, obviously, you see below for you know in the, the reductions. Um, and at first, uh, it was a little bit odd uh, until we dug a little bit deeper. And really, it has to do with the differing site conditions, different geotechnical conditions, um, and even differing housing sewer construction methods that were used in a given area. Um, that's why you're going to get a decent range. You can do uh, a similar type study in four or five areas. We compared this to other areas in the country. And there was a broad range for each type of technology noted below. So you're not going to have a one-size-fits-all. Um, you really need a toolbox. You need to pick uh, what method you want to use in a given area based on um, what you're seeing. Is it, you know, is, is it a sandy soil? Is it, a, is it clay? Is it, are the older houses likely have foundation drains tied into um, those types of situations? You have to, you have to know the answers to. Um, for reductions, and this included, you know, to do this. We uh, had actually a year and a half of meter results after construction was complete for each of these projects. Uh, so that's how we came up with the, the, the reduction estimates, in addition to having uh, control areas for both pre and post. Um, the mainline sewer and mantles, which was that initial SCS work, had a reduction of 5 to 30 percent. Uh, the lateral connections in the main, and the main lines of the lateral connection uh, plus the main line work was an additional, or was 25 percent. Um, when you did the mainline sewer work and manhole work, and then you added in the lateral rehab, we saw a reduction of 15 to 50 percent, and then the inflow removal uh, with the mainline sewer work was 
anywhere between 15 and 75 percent reduction in II. Um, moving forward, we are in the process of updating those 2010-2011 SSO elimination plans, which is going to be into one document that we're calling a master plan that is due to be submitted to EPA in June. Um, we're using the results of this study uh, to update the 10 percent removal that we had forecast previously and also to um, target areas with additional II removal and reduce the amount of relief sewers or other capacity improvements that we had to make uh, based on that other report. Project cost, which I think is something that you know everyone's pretty interested in. Now keep in mind that each one of these represented in contracts are 200 to 300 laterals. Um, replacing the lateral to the property line, uh, which is about 30 feet in our case, uh, averaged between six and seven thousand dollars a lateral, and that was that's the excavated uh, dig replacement. Um, the lateral connection seal uh, was a range between sixteen hundred and eighteen hundred dollars per uh, seal, and in our case, that was the the brim style, as uh, Jonathan mentioned in his presentation, uh, plus uh, 12 to 18 inches up the lateral. Um, the lateral lining to the property line, uh, that was between five and 5,200 uh, a piece. That did not require a clean out. And then lateral lining to the house with that clean out, uh, which is about 60 feet, uh, average between seven and 7,300. So as you can see, there's not a huge difference in price between the, two, the last two items on the screen uh, for the clean out. Uh, or per foot, so really the clean out is the, is the majority of the cost difference. Um, so just some photos before we uh, continue on with uh, questions. The top left and bottom right question, uh, photos on your screen uh, just show a typical uh, lateral lining truck. Uh, this was actually a contractor that was doing ambient cure methods for insulation. Um, the top right photo on your screen is looking up the lateral after that lining had been done. And then bottom left is looking down the main line at that brim style connection um, from the lateral rehab. More project photos. Uh, regardless of, you know, obviously the, the, with any kind of trenchless technology, you're going to have less impact to um, the public and less impact to uh, traffic and whatnot than you would with an open cut method, but you're still uh, going to have some impacts. And the top left is that's a bypass system that was used for a, a lateral connection seal contract uh, in a somewhat um, uh, suburban area in West Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, top, the the right hand picture and the bottom left picture were two pictures of uh, the same lateral after it had been steam cured uh, using an access pit to some constraints on the site. Uh, with this, I will uh, hand it over back to Ted uh, for any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And, and I'll leave up the first question that we got when you started was, hey, another Wilkes grad. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> there's somebody else out there. Um, there were an awful lot of questions about dealing with private property I&I. &I. Um, so I'm going to try to try to uh, put those, some of those together. But first of all, uh, can you describe kind of the, what's your district's responsibility uh, between the main line and the property line and the and the house, what what is your your district's responsibility there? Uh, we own and maintain the main line sewer. Um, the property owner owns the the from their service lateral from the main line to the house. However, we will maintain and repair uh, between the main line sewer and the property line or the right of way line. Okay. So if, and an obstruction is, if, if an obstruction is found on the homeowner's side of the property line, we then notify them and they are responsible to repair it. Okay, and I guess, you know, we're talking a lot about infiltration, and that's really the bottom line of a lot of these questions that we're getting. Um, so has there been any consideration, and I kind of uh, like to open this up to, some, to the other presenters too, but has there been any consideration on the use of public funds uh, to reduce I and I on that part of the private property where you know you're legally not responsible. Um, yeah, I, I can take a stab at that. Um, in our particular case, we are reducing I and I um, as part of a global overall program uh, to close overflows. Um, so, are you improving a privately owned asset? Yes. However, um, you're also 
um, reducing the amount of bigger pipes that you would have to construct or other capital improvements would, would ultimately would cost your ratepayers more than it would be to do this other work on a larger scale. Yeah, and, and Sean and, and Jonathan, if, you, if you're still uh, connected, sure. uh, can you, would you comment on that? Yeah, Ted, uh, this is Sean, WSC. Um, I was just going to mention that, um, yeah, we, we take into consideration, like someone noted, that they saw the, uh, the downspout connection. Uh, those are some of the things that we try to tackle uh, when they're found. Uh, with the size of the system, once again, it just makes it, you know, overwhelming to try to catch what's, you know, beyond the property line. It's definitely something being taken into consideration, but at this time, we don't really have a program to tackle anything beyond the property line. Uh, but it's definitely been looked at, um, you know, but the status of that is just kind of open right now. We haven't really tackled uh, that, but that might be something that comes up in the future. It's definitely something to consider for sure. Right, and, and I know I've, I've been to legal presentations where they did say that legally it's something that can stand up uh, use of, you know, use of public funds and private property for the overall good of the, the system. Uh, Jonathan, do you have any comments on that? Again, that was a recurring question. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've dealt with varying situations. Here in New England, we have lots of different sized towns, and every town has a different type of um, rule regarding what gets owned. I mean, I've got some clients where they own just the connection at the main and, and others that they own the entire service lateral. So uh, I'm dealing with one particular instance right now where it's a consent order project and the reality is a lot of flow has to be removed and, and it's exactly what you just said, Ted. It's, it's using taxpayer money uh, and in this case even SRF funded monies to rehabilitate private property, but for the good of, you know, drinking water, drink, you know, waterways within the Commonwealth is what we're trying to say, and that we're dealing with lawyers for that in that regard. Yeah, that that's kind of seems to be a common common theme, but um, Sean actually raises that you know, you ha you have to have the budget for it too, and if it's just too many of them, that's, uh, that makes it very tough. Yes. Um, okay, going uh, going back uh, to Jason's presentation, do you require Installation of a clean out where laterals to be lined, and do you install these at the property line or at the limit of the exposed liner? In our cases, when we had the clean outs to be lined, we installed them five feet behind the, on the property owner's side of the property line. Um, so that way, it would, it would the clean out would be considered an asset that the property owner would own and maintain, um, and and not something that we would be held responsible for moving forward. Uh, the other thing in discussing with the property owners and trying to sell the project to them because this was an optional program, it wasn't a mandatory program. Mm -hmm. um, one of the benefits that we presented to them was the clean out giving them one more access point to their lateral for future use. Um, so it was something we didn't, we, we didn't want to install it on, on the property line or on our side of the property line. Okay. And um, I had several questions about measurement. How, how did you measure uh, the reductions in I and I that, that you discussed? Uh, we had metering for about a year uh, in each sub area in advance, uh, like during the design phase, and then during the con after the construction was over, it was about a year and a half of metering again. Um, we used the pre and post, and then also had control areas in the same sub basins before and after, um, uh, and picked out storms that were comparable uh, pre and post, and, and then estimated the reduction that way. And Another question, did you implement or did you consider pipe bursting in any of these projects? Um, and, and if so, what were the results? Uh, we did not. Um, generally in our area uh, of the Northeast with the soil conditions, it's really not um, feasible on a large scale. Uh, it is something that we're considering for future parts of our uh, clean water project. Um, but as part of the pilot program, we did not, con we did not uh, look at uh, pipe bursting. And, and uh, what was the? Uh, actually, let me let me direct that uh, to Sean. Sean, did you sure. did you look at uh, lateral pipe bursting um, in your work at WSSC? Uh, we do. Uh, we we use that as a method, kind of for for areas where we really wanted to excavate, um, but you know certain towns in the area that we have are, are pretty strict on tree control, uh, and there you know there were other things like property walls, things like that, um, and we did use uh, pipe bursting for the laterals themselves. It's 
not your not your typical HDPE. It was a, a jointed pipe, you know, kind of a I don't have the specs of the pipe right in front of me, but like you know C900 that you'd use on deep main, something like that. The, the PVC was a thicker wall, um, you know, and it comes out essentially if you TV it, it looked like an excavated main uh, lateral connection actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm jumping around now. I'm going back to Jason. Uh, did you use uh, only the, the brim connection liners, or did you use some full uh, wrap liners? Uh, we used only the brim style. Uh, the only full wrap that we've done uh, was in cases of uh, spot repairs or, or uh, that had to be done uh, due to various liner issues if you had a wrinkle on a mainline sewer and it had to be cut out. But uh, for our lateral connections, it was all the brim style. And it was okay. all on sewers that had been lined before. We did not do uh, any lateral lining, whether it be the brim or the you know the, the lateral lining up to the property line or main uh, on pipes that had not been lined yet. Okay. Um, jumping around a little bit, did uh, did you use because uh, there was a couple questions actually regarding smoke testing. Did you use smoke testing to to find these issues? We did uh, when we. During the SCS program, uh, we uh, used the metering to either target whether or not an area had high inflow, high infiltration, or both. Um, if the area had high infl inflow, we then uh, would use smoke testing and eventually building inspection to target the sources of inflow. Okay. Um, going back to the whole private property I and I and and you know the use of uh, federal funding, or not, I'm sorry, but municipal funding or uh, to do those repairs. Um, have have any of you actually worked with, worked in jobs where the property owner was actually offered a um, you know to actually do their part of the, of the line as part of this project and actually pay for that part of it if that if that was an issue? Was there any kind of coordination that was done with the property owners? So they could actually fund the part, you know, that it would actually benefit them. Um, for for the district, all of the clean water project um, construction and, and design work is funded by a special sewer service charge. Um, so ultimately, all the member towns, um, the customers are paying for it. Um, the only coordination with the property owner uh, would have been on the um, private property inflow removal work, where they the way our agreements were structured with the particular property owners, they owned and were responsible for the sump pumps that we ended up installing um, from a certain point after construction was over to in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Sean, Sean, can you comment on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, once again, kind of going back, we haven't really done anything where we've where we've essentially funded any private property rehabilitation, but. Um, Kind of outside of the lateral pro lateral projects, we also do have private systems. Uh, there there are towns that that essentially empty into our system um, that are isolated within the area, um, such as you know city of Rockville um, and some smaller uh, you know retirement communities, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, that I know of, I don't know that we've done any sort of funding to to benefit those systems. Um, but that is something we consider because they do empty into our system. Um, and, and when I say private system, you know, you talk about multiple manholes, uh, you know, six to eight inch mm -hmm. pipes, sometimes bigger. Um, but that's something I can look into, you know, if we want to follow up later. Right. Yeah. And again, there was a, I just said there was a whole lot of questions about, you know, legal issues with private property and I and I. One of them that actually just came up was has. Any of the lateral work actually changed ordinances or, or building requirements or codes uh, in your municipalities? And Jason, can you uh, take that? And then I'd like to hear from the others. Um, in our program, it has not. Um, we have our, our ordinances, um, or you know, in our sewer ordinances, have not been changed as a result of this. Obviously, we're still pretty early in the grand scheme of things for our uh, com our consent decree program. Um, and as far as the building inspection uh, aspects, that that relies solely on the responsibility of the member towns. Um, they do, um, as a in a, in conjunction with our ordinances, they do not allow uh, stormwater connections to non-combined areas. However, that wasn't a result of the the lateral rehab work. That was uh, that that was an ordinance that was created prior to the clean water project. 
Yen, uh, Ted, this is Sean, WSC again. I, I, I think, um, you know, our, our consent decree is a, a fairly similar age to Jason's. Um, I think it's something you might start seeing in the future. Uh, one thing that might be unique to the Suburban Sanitary Commission is that we, we do handle on-site inspections. There is a, a plumbing and gas code department. Um, so, you know, with all the changes in rehabilitation taking place, you know, in this past 10 years and going forward, it's, it's probably something that you'll start seeing changes to um, where they're actually writing in different methods and, and, and things like that. Um, and that's also another way that we kind of handle at least, you know, recent um, installations is that there is an on-site inspection process, so that does kind of help us handle what's being built, you know, over the past 30 years or so. Um, something we can't really change to the older, uh, you know, things that have been built, but at least we can kind of take control and kind of kind of say what's emptying into the system from here out, you know, it kind of helps us out that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's past our time. Uh, I appreciate everyone uh, keeping on. Sean, Jonathan, and Jason, really appreciate uh, your presentations. Thanks. We had a, a whole lot of questions. I'm, I'm not sure how many, but we had a lot of questions. We're going to what, what we'll be doing is looking at trying to kind of consolidate a lot of those questions and then making them available. Um, it, it'll take some time to do that, but we appreciate really the interest for everyone who participated in this. I want to thank again our sponsors, uh, ProPipe and BLD Services, um, for making this webcast possible and funding this webcast. And again, thank you to all of you uh, for participating. We hope to get back to you again on answers to the questions. Um, you know, so uh, appreciate all your participation and thank you for joining us. So long. <laughs>